it's uh, it's very it's very nice to um, have you here. I hope you're well seated with a, a cup of coffee or tea. That's the big advantage of uh, online events. So let's uh, let's all enjoy that. It's my pleasure to to host today's R adoption event from the R adoption series. My name is Colleen Ceballos. I'm R strategy lead at Roche Informatics and also an active member of the R consortium. Uh, just to give you a little background uh, before we I, before I continue about this event, um, in April I gave a talk at the DIA FDA conference about submissions in R, and after that my colleague from Roche Ning Lang suggested that we also bring a similar content to you guys here with the R adoption at the R adoption series. So here we are today. We're very lucky to have three FDA collaborators um, who will speak. It's very exciting. But just before we start, I had a couple of quick slides. Very uh, a bit of formality, but uh, we want to thank the sponsors who make this event, an event like this, possible. The R Consortium, Fuse, PSI, and today the BBSW. The, um, the you know the for those who, for who is the first time uh, you join the R Adoption Series, it's aimed at anybody who has uh, initiatives in the R world. Uh, so feel free to go on the website and uh, to contact Andy Nichols, who leads the organization of those events. The next event uh, we will be in September. We don't know exactly when, but check the websites for updates. And also last thing for this slide, you can find previous webinars uh, recording on the webpage. So follow the link here. We will share the slides after the conference. Today's session, so uh, it starts with a, a show, the short opening with me. Then we will have Ryan and Haisu from the FDA who will present for about 20 minutes each. And then we'll have a panel discussion for the rest of the, um, of the, the conference. So feel free to post your questions on the chat. Uh, Ning will be uh, moderating the panel discussion and collecting your questions so that we can ask them live and get responses from our uh, FDA speakers. Also um, important to know that uh, we will have a third FDA collaborator, Paul who's not speaking, but who will be part of the panel panel discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to ask Ryan to come forward. Uh, Ryan is a senior statistical reviewer at the FDA. He has experience reviewing phase three and four, safety and efficacy focused reviews. He has a PhD degree in biostatistics from Yale University. Ryan, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, can you hear me? And yes, okay. So, yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Taeyeon Ryan Jung, and I'm a senior stati statistical reviewer from Office of Biostatistics, uh, CEDAR, FDA. And thank you, Colleen and Ning, for your kind introduction and inviting me to this exciting event. So, in this presentation, I would like to share my recent review experience from a regulatory approval of real world, ev real -world evidence supplement uh, NDA submission. And throughout this review, R was used for the entire submission in the real-world data management and data analysis. For disclaimer, this presentation reflects the views of myself and should not be construed to represent FDA views or policy, and there is no relevant financial relationship for this pre presentation. Uh, this is the uh, statistical clarifying statement. Uh, FDA is software agnostic and does not encourage nor require use of a specific software package. However, uh, the software package used for statistical analysis should be fully documented in the submission, including versions and build identification. Here's the outline of today's presentation. Uh, due to the limited time, I'll briefly walk you through the overview of the ProGraph Real World Evidence Supplement NDA submission. For further study designs and analysis uh, in detail, I will refer to this sponsor study uh, published uh, last June. And then I'll go through the pre and post uh, discussion between uh, FD and the sponsor in regards to using R for this regulatory submission. And at the end, I will show how the R markdown uh, supported the regulatory review and wrap up with the lessons learned from the regulatory perspective. So as you may know, in July 2021, a new indication uh, was approved for TechLMS with the brand name of ProGraph. And this was the CEDAR's first acceptance of an observational or non-interventional study as an adequate and well-controlled study, providing the primary support for a finding of sub substantial evidence of effectiveness. So it showed real-world data is no longer limited to supportive, but able to play as a primary evidence that meets FDA regulatory standards. 
And here's the timeline of progress approval. Uh, so the 21st Century Care Act gave birth to the 2018 RWFD framework. And the sponsor, Estella, started to plan to obtain an approval for a new indication of progress. And according to the sponsor, uh, they got governance project approval on April 2019 with no data and no protocol. And after their search uh, for real-world data sources and drafting protocols, the sponsor had the first Type C meeting with FDA to ask the adequacy of real-world data selection, proposed outcomes, exposures, and uh, st the, the statistical analysis plan. And after our comments, uh, they went back to just plans and come back to the second Type C uh, uh, to discuss the, the dose recommendation, exposures, and data source. And at the Type B pre-NDA meeting, uh, we discussed a new data science practice for the submission uh, because there were several issues that we didn't expect in RCT submissions. So surprisingly, uh, it took only 20 months to prepare a submission package for SNDA, starting with no data and no protocol, whereas conventional large phase three trials take many years with a huge amount of money from conception to completion. And this uh, SNDA was granted priority, priority review with a six month clock uh, since there was no FDA approved immunosuppressant drug products for lung transplant, lung, uh, transplant recipients. In the later slides, I will focus on the discussion between FDA and the sponsor communication for using R. Now, uh, let's start with the clinical regulatory background. The, Tacrolimus is indicated for the prophylaxis of organ rejection in adult and pediatric patients receiving allogenic lung transplantation in combination with immunosuppressants. Under the brand name program, Tacrolimus was originally approved by FDA in 1994 for the prophylaxis of rejection in liver transplant recipients, followed by the kidney transplant in 1997 and the heart transplant in 2006 based on RCT evidence. Although RCT for lung transplantation hasn't been submitted to FDA, uh, this drug has been widely used as, used as the mainstay of immunosuppressive regimen in most transplant recipients, not only for the approved indication, but also off-label. So the sponsor designed the study as a non-interventional study for the analysis of treatment and outcomes for patients who receive a lung transplantation and compared to historical control in the absence of combination immunosuppressant therapy. The primary endpoint was a composite endpoint of graft failure or death within one year post-transplant. And this study used the scientific registry of transplant recipients data, hereafter referred to as SRTR data, on all lung transplantations in the United States between 1999 and 2017. The study population of interest uh, include uh, adult and pediatric patients in tacrolimus immediate release in combination with mycophenolate monofil and azotherapy. Now let's deep dive into the um, SRTR real world data. So SRTR is a national transplant registry uh, and made available under a data use agreement to external use researchers. So it's a public data and includes outcomes for all transplant recipients in the United States since 1987. For program real world evidence application, the sponsor submitted the relevant SRTR standard analytic file. That's the raw, uh, that's the final data set that, uh, that I'll explain more in the later slides. Uh, and that uh, the SAF was, cho was chosen between uh, 1999 and 2017, and the cutoff is based on the tra tracolimus increasing uses since 1999. And here's the visual flow uh, of transplant data starting from local hospitals to SRT registry, supplemented by uh, CMS and Social Security Death Master File. The Center for Medicare and Medicare Service uh, CMS supplements the end stage renal disease information. So it doesn't really apply here in the lung transplantation case. Uh, for more detailed data collection process and data management, uh, I will refer to the SRTR public website. Uh, this is a snapshot of the public data dictionary of SRTR standard analytic files, and SAF is the real-world data from the SRTR for which the raw data is provided in a transform format. The final data set of interest submitted for FDA was generated from the SAF, and it, it included to, uh, 20,000 is subjects with 453 variables in one final single data set. So you might assume the sponsor didn't submit the data set and see this format, which is the FD standard, and your, your assumption is then correct. And here's a rough comparison uh, between conventional RCT and DABLA submission and the program submission. 
As usual, both have common documents such as study reports and defined documents. And FDA electronic submission gateway were used um, to submit data regardless of the type of submission. Unlike typical NDA submission, the Paragraph RW submission had several challenges because of the complex char characteristics of the non-interventional real-world data. Uh, because it is, it is RWD, their length of variables were longer than the FDA standard. So SAS export version 8 was requested by the sponsor, whereas FDA standard is version 5. And this is another long story that I cannot address here uh, to, uh, due to the time, but the irregular format of real-world data was not compatible with the FDA standard. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to my knowledge, and for the first time, uh, the sponsor used our program for the entire submission, where SAS is the prevalent language in FDA submission. Now let's see the communication between the sponsor and the FDA before and after submission. So before the submission, the sponsor and FDA had multiple rounds of communications. The first discussion was open at the Type C meeting, and the sponsor asked whether a hybrid of SAS and R is, a, a, is acceptable. So we said it's okay. And in the Type B meeting of on August 2020, the sponsor asked whether using R markdown is okay and the program submitted in RMD and HTML formats will be acceptable for review. Uh, we agree with the program submission using R markdown, uh, but ask sponsors to generate the final format into both HTML and PDF formats to give easy access to other review teams. Also, uh, we ask uh, them to specify alternative package if, uh, if, if applicable. And importantly, uh, we ask uh, the sponsor to submit a sample data of 200 subjects with relevant programs and documents. And this is not only be because of using R, but also because of several submission issues using SAS export version 8. The sponsor submitted sample data and the code with relevant documents in November 2020. And we assessed those sample, ma uh, sample materials and found no issues at the time. So during the NDA review, we sent a uh, we sent out a couple of information requests because we experienced some difficulties. First, installing the company on our package. Uh, some compatibility issues occurred in this package, and the sponsor didn't disclose a GitHub allowing for manual download. So we asked the sponsor to submit the GitHub, GitHub address or clarify and clarify the required R version, provide a reference manual uh, for this package. Another information request. Uh, was sent on April uh, because we, we experienced difficulties using sponsor suggested LaTeX editor in the analysis stage. Well, uh, we do our own pro programming, uh, independent programming first, and I didn't notice until I tried replication using their codes. And I found uh, the analysis part was using a LaTeX editor and didn't work well uh, in the, in our computers. And this LaTeX editor, editor was used for to make a like better font uh, for the outputs. So it was not that necessary, but it uh, was, uh, used for the whole uh, analysis part, so I, I couldn't uh, move on. So I, after I spent a couple of days to solve this with the tech team, uh, this was not solvable for, for unknown reasons. So I, asked the, so I asked the sponsor to submit the whole R&D programs in a LaTeX-free environment. Now, uh, I would like to share the real practice uh, of real-world data management using R from the program submission. So first, the SRTR provides several pieces of raw uh, SAF data files and SAS format only. Uh, it's their rule. And uh, the app, the sponsor converted SAS to CSV files and then loaded into R to create a data set of interest. Well, as you may know, there is a direct way of converting SAS to R data, but the app, the sponsor con conducted in this way to check the quality between the transformation steps because that's because it had longer variable names uh, in, in export version 8. And we were concerned about any truncation during the uh, transformation. And uh, their quality checks include uh, assessing any uh, truncation da of data and using just simple statistics. So it's like comparing the mean, uh, whether it, whether the mean and the standard deviant is exactly same uh, before and after transformation. So uh, it's not a, a special tool, but it was useful to check at least they were maintaining the same data. And the majority of the programming uh, was performed in R Markdown, which provided both the R codes as well as the comments and intermittent results uh, in a unified framework. And as a step review with zero knowledge in the SRTR da database, I think this was a great practice uh, because it provided transparent data management procedure and efficiently executed the codes.
And the formatted SAS variables were converted into corresponding uh, CSV variables, and that were composed of both unformatted and formatted va values. And they, uh, the sponsor imported the CSV files into R to create the data set of interest. So that's the procedure of uh, hopping from XPT to CSV and then finalize with R, uh, R data. The sponsor uh, analysis data supports all protocols and statistical analysis plan specified objectives. The final essay of data include one record per patient containing all variable used in the tables and figures. And it includes uh, efficacy, safety, and baseline characteristic variables, but not the PKPD the variables. As the analysis was not an FDA for standard format, of course, they clarified that they didn't do conformance check. And although they did some quality check uh, when transforming uh, CSV to R files, uh, as I said, it's just checking whether the numbers are matched using simple metrics. And like the, and the uh, RCT and DABLA submission, the applicant uh, provided ADRG, Analysis Data Reviewer Guide, uh, and, and uh, looks like and feels like defined document. And these documents were very helpful when understanding the data structure and the data management process. So here's how the analysis data set is created. So starting from the SRTR SAF, which has SAS export version 8, the imported data was stored in the SAS library with the SAS 7B that extension. Next, the sponsor exported two Excel CSV files. I think this step might be unnecessary because the data can be directly transformed from SAS XP2 to R data using available package. However, it appears the sponsor wanted to make a safer choice during the data transformation. And then you can see uh, the CSV data are fed into each relevant R markdown programs on, on the uh, right tables. And at each interim stage, you can see the flow of the output data, which becomes the input in the next stage and so on. So it's like stacking uh, cakes step by step to subset the SAF data and build a study specific to review the stat team um, Consider this was an excellent data processing practice because this streamlined framework uh, provides super clear and easy to follow update, uh, management procedures. And even though uh, we had like zero knowledge in this registry data, uh, this process really helped me uh, help us understood the complex data structure and the data management process of the real world data. Uh, the R markdown output in HTML format looked good uh, like this and was helpful during the review. And here's some snapshots of the data management and analysis output. And you can see there is a navigation panel to go over different sections. So it was uh, quite convenient when we had to communicate with uh, clinicians. Uh, we don't need to go back, uh, tap um, uh, multiple like documents to, to, to show the, the analysis results. But uh, this worked, uh, I think this worked well for a, a communication purpose. So through this program, uh, uh, no, it, uh, it, here's another page for the output. Um, and through this program application, we learned the importance of transparency of real world data. And this is because real world data source are desperate, des disparate and non-uniform, and they by, thereby will be difficult for us to understand the data source comprehensively in the beginning. For this submission, the real world data structure was really complex and, and yeah, we had no prior knowledge or experience with this is registry data. And all, although reviewers uh, usually don't start review from the data management, and I had to do this uh, for this time. So R Markdown uh, played a very important role, uh, especially in the data management, uh, because it provided a transplant and streamlined process for review. Uh, the HTML output allowed easy navigation through the results and supported interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. And we experienced uh, lots of challenge when using R Markdown for the review. So uh, uh, my recommendation would be uh, it would be good it would be good to provide all necessary documents uh, to aid a pro review process uh, at one time, submit all relevant analytic package and complex features like unnecessary uh, stuff or or those features may not be compatible with FDA of computer environment. And uh, the goal should be uh, making the code an analyzable and executable, and that's totally fine for uh, as a reviewer. Uh, as a reviewer, so uh, as I uh, described, like simple coding practice are just just fine. And uh, so, 
yeah, this, and oh, sorry. And um, my last message is, uh, so if you plan to uh, use any R programming uh, for your submission, uh, discuss the availability prior to submission and the sample data and codes uh, will be very helpful for the reviews to prepare us uh, to switch from the SAS world to the R world. Uh, and I'm aware of uh, the ongoing efforts of our regulatory submissions. And, I, uh, and our next speaker, Hesu, will uh, present about this exciting topic. So I think uh, this is all I have today, and I'll be happy to get uh, any questions from the, the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan, for this talk and sharing this detailed work for the specific real world data use case. We rarely get this internal view, so uh, us from the industry. So really thank you for that and see you in the panel discussion. And also everyone in the audience, before I introduce my next, our next speaker, don't forget to progressively send your questions over in the chat on the right. It's under the stage tab and Q&A. So our next speaker is Hai Su. She's a stat statistical analyst in the Office of Biostatistics at the FDA. She has a bachelor degree in statistics from UC Berkeley and a master degree in biostatistics from Northwestern University. Welcome, Hai Su. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for introducing me and um, thanks for having me today. So my name is Hei Su Cho. Uh, I'm a statistical analyst at CEDAR here for the FDA. And I review the R consortium, R-based pilot one submissions. So I like to talk about open source software and share my review experience today. Also, uh, I'd like to thank Paul Shuri for making his slide available for me to use. So here is the standard disclaimer. So this presentation reflects the views of the author and should not be construed the, um, to represent the FDA's views or policies. So uh, Ryan shows this statement earlier, but since this is important, let me start with reading the 2015 statistical software clarifying statement again. So FDA does not require use of any specific software for statistical analysis, and statistical software is not explicitly discussed in Title 21 of the Code of the Federal Regulations. However, the software packages used for statistical analysis should be fully documented in the submissions, including version and build identifications. So for FDA submissions, a sponsor can use any valid software for statistical analysis, but should clearly specify the version of the software as well as all the packages and libraries um, that go into it. Um, as noted in the FDA guidance, E9 statistical principles for clinical trials, the computer software used for data management and statistical analysis should be reliable. And the documentation of appropriate software testing procedures should be available. Sponsors are encouraged to consult with the FDA review teams and especially with the FDA statisticians regarding the choice and the suitability of statistical software packages at an early stage in the product development process. So um, if a sponsor has any concerns or question regarding using open source software, FDA highly recommends sponsor consult with the FDA review team um, early on. Um, then what are the proprietary and open source software? So there is a clear guidance documents stating that there is no need to submit any particular software. However, the FDA submissions have been mainly based on SAS languages, which is proprietary software. So proprietary software is non-free or closed source software, and it can be expensive. And the source code can only be examined and modified by original um, owner of the software exclusively. And SAS and Stata are the example of proprietary software. 
Um, on the other hand, open source is publicly accessible. So it is distributed with this source code, making it anyone with academic knowledge available for inspections, modification, and enhancement. And the examples are R and Python. And R is what I will focus on in this presentation. Then um, what are the reasons to use open source software and what are the challenges, especially in um, R? So there are many benefits and challenges, but I just highlighted some of them here. So um, anyone can install and use R for free. So think about it. Um, if you have to pay a couple thousands of dollars um, for one year license of a proprietary software, or you have to pay extra um, license fee to add more functionality, um, you might just want to choose open source software because it's free. So cost of software is one of the reasons to use open source software. Second, innovations. So adaptability to new trend is much faster with open source. For example, um, R packages can be developed by anyone in the R community. And if you don't see a solutions, you can create and distribute your own R package. And anyone, anyone can contribute to optimizing R packages and resolving errors um, if there are any. So that's why well-known machine learning algorithms are mostly available in R. And um, when we think about how to handle like unstructured EHR data, which is, a kind, which is kind of a hot topic these days, um, R gives more uh, flexible and innovative method to deal with this new trend. Um, increasingly interactive data visualizations and dashboard created with R Shiny apps are getting common as well. So innovation is the reason um, people use open source software. And third, um, training and familiarity. So with all this trend and shift from SAS to R, uh, increased number of schools are teaching R over SAS. So recent graduates are more, like to, more likely to be um, familiar with R than SAS. And pharmaceutical industry also um, investing heavily in R. Um, so these are the reasons to use the open source software. However, there are some challenges with open source. So perception of quality. Um, some people consider open source more secure and stable than proprietary software because anyone can um, spot and rectify errors that might have missed by the original um, developer or publishers. However, other people think differently. Um, they think um, security threats are potential vulnerability of open source because there is a lack of controls and have some mistrust in the open source community. Validations. So the reason why FDA submission is mainly based on SAS, because SAS is validated software. However, the open source software um, are not always perceived to be validated. Support. Um, what would you do if you have question about the R? Um, you may go to Stack Overflow and then find the solutions as there are huge R community out there with discussion and questions. However, um, open source does, does not have any dedicated technical support. So when you face any technical challenges um, that you can get answer from the Stack Overflow, the lack of former support could be frustrating. And the lastly, um, dealing with legacy code. So many companies have legacy code, which has been reused over and over, um, written using proprietary software. So ability to switch to um, different software might be somewhat limited, especially in big pharma companies. Um, 
Now let's talk about my review experience of R Pilot One. So our consortium group submitted R based test submission packages um, to FDA on November 2021 last year. And the objectivity was to test the concept that uh, an R language based submission packages can meet the needs and the expectation of the FDA reviewers, including assessing code review and analysis reproducibility. So our consortium group wanted to showcase the feasibility of submitting our code. So it was based on um, small simulated clinical trial data set uh, with very simple analysis. And then the evaluating FDA acceptance of a system and software validation evidence is not in the scope of this pilot. And so all data set code and documents are publicly available um, using the link here. So um, the main components of the submissions were Adam data set, um, a, a PDF report for with four analysis outputs, an analysis data reviewer's guide, which is the ADRG, and then analysis output programs in R, file, uh, R files, and then sponsor developed uh, R package in TXT file. So um, just noted that ideally SDTM dataset and Atom generation program and Atom dataset, these all three are commonly submitted to FDA, but in this pilot, we just receive Atom dataset and it seems sufficient um, for these submissions. And we may um, look into running an additional pilot in the futures that provides more comprehensive packaging. And in ADRG, um, Analysis Data Reviewer's Guide, uh, the sponsor clearly specify our versions. So they used our version 4.1.0, and then all packages names and each versions, and then the description. And then we also asked them to provide details instructions to execute the um, analysis program in R. So they provided how to, how to install open source R package and then sponsor developed R package. Um, so they provided the details and it's in the ADRG document. And then these are the um, four analysis output. So first table was summary of the demographic and baseline characteristic. And then um, they also provide the cap and Mario plot. And then um, these two tables were changed from baseline to a certain weeks using ENCOBA model. So different open source packages were used when generating this four tables to test wider use case of scenarios. Um, so, so our consortium used our version 4.1.0, but using the R version 4.1.1, FDA was able to run the submitted code and confirm the submitted tables and figures. And using FDA developed code, FDA was able to independently generate tables using the submitted data. So there were no major issues uh, with accessing code and reproducibility, but there were some minor issues. So first was the rounding issues. So when you compute a 95 confidence interval in R, um, R has more, uh, R has many different packages and then ways to uh, ways you can choose. And R also gives flexibility to choose either approximate value of 1.96 or precise quantile. So the inconsistency um, is inconsistency way to calculate the 95 confidence interval um, caused the minor discrepancy. And another thing that we pointed out was each tables and figures should be standalone. So this is not particularly applicable to these submissions, but all other submissions. 
um, some important information such as um, specification of the ANCOVA model was not given in the table. Uh, but each table and figure sh should be intel um, intelligible without referencing to the text or code. So these were the things that we follow with the our consortium, con our consortium group, and then we completed the uh, pilot one. And then we might find more potential issues in the futures, but one thing that we discussed was package dependency. Um, so when the analysis get complicated or use lots of different packages, um, the package um, dependency could be matters. So maybe submitting our package dependency chart uh, might be useful in the review process. So um, as a result, we received the electronic submission package in ECTD approved format and we constructed and loaded the submitted sponsor developed it R package. And we installed it and loaded open source packages using the um, submission. And we reproduced the analysis result independently and shared the potential improvements for submission deliverables and processes via written communication. So in conclusions, um, we were able to complete the first publicable, a publicly available R language based submissions. And we highly recommend sponsor communicate with the FDA um, regarding using open source software. So this concludes my presentations and um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Hi Su. Thank you very much. We'll now go to the panel discussion. I shortly introduce um, the other FDA, um, not speaker, but uh, FDA uh, collaborator who will be part of the panel discussion, Paul Chouette. Uh, he's a mathematical statistician, scientific computing coordinator in the FDA. And uh, he has a master degree and PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, with a specialization in probability theory. And I hand over to Ning Leng to host the panel discussion. Enjoy everyone. Thank you very much. <clears throat> hi, Paul. Hi, Hiso. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Really enjoy uh, learning about uh, uh, learning from you. So in the next uh, next an hour or so, so basically we will go over a couple of questions. We have some prepared questions. Uh, I will go over them first, and uh, we will also start addressing some questions from the live Q and A uh, in the in the chat box. Yeah. So I will start with some questions, just trying to understand more on like what does FDA reviewer or FDA staff's uh, daily life look like when you review a package? Uh, I guess like, could you maybe elaborate, elaborate a little bit on that? Like what system you are using, whether you are using like laptop or a server and uh, how do you retrieve like our packages from CRAN, from GitHub? Or some like proprietary packages submitted by the the by the uh, like uh, the submitters. Yeah. Ryan or Hiso, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can start first. Uh, can you hear me? Well, yeah. that, that was a lot of sub question and under one question, but uh, I'll just start with my daily life. So when we receive uh, a review, um, I go into look into the ADRG and define document uh, first uh, to before I get into the data set. So I, I read, uh, well, well, I check what are all uh, necessary things are all are submitted and read uh, the ADR or G to understand the data and play with, start playing with the data. And mostly uh, it's it says uh, used for our reviews, but for the program, it was R Markdown and uh, R Markdown, I haven't used uh, for a long time. I used it during my doctoral studies, but it was like more than like five five years ago. So I had to like refresh my memories by uh, looking into uh, old school documents, uh, materials, and also use uh, YouTube <laughs> to refresh my memory, but, and it worked. So uh, so I, I started playing with uh, the uh, sponsor submission, submitted uh, R Markdown uh, uh, documents uh, with the data. And that 
uh, was kind of fun. <laughs> and uh, what was the other question? I guess uh, maybe can you elaborate a little bit on like how you retrieve, like say, like a Chrome package, GitHub package. Oh, oh, yeah. and, well, yeah. so uh, so uh, my, my computer and most of our computer uh, for reviews are just laptop, uh, and it we have a our studio or SaaS installed in our laptop. So it's just like not different from you guys. It just uh, installed a uh, new package from Cran, updated from Cran. If uh, like, but the company owned package, like in the program view, that was not available in Cran and they didn't have a GitHub. So that's why we asked uh, the package to submit through the uh, electronic submission gateway and, uh, and it worked in that way. But except those, uh, uh like private package i think uh, uh our activities are very similar to yours gotcha yeah so basically like for different fda staff different fda reviewers because like you use uh, your own like a uh, laptop uh company laptop uh, or uh, uh, like a uh, outside laptop over there so basically the package versions can be different like from different right. stuff yeah yeah just as a special uh uh, transition that we have, we are having is like we are moving SaaS uh, from um, desktop to SaaS analytic remote grid environment, Sarge. So it's kind of a new practice for us, and uh, maybe uh, like, uh, Paul and Hesu will be more be more knowledgeable about this than me. And I'm still learning how to use that in in Sarge, but our uh, we are still using it in our laptop with Windows system. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I can just echo what Ryan said. I mean, we're in the same situation. So you're just using our FDA laptop to uh, run the R code and then packages. So I will, I start with the reading the ADRG that sponsor submitted because that's where the sponsor provide the, all the specific informations such as like what version they use or what package they use. So once I check their versions and I think the sponsor should use the recent version of the software and packages. So if I, once I check their version and if the version that is installed in my laptop is not a huge different, I just run, um, I just use my version first to replicate the result and then investigate further if there is any discrepancy. So, um, and yeah, that's how I um, start analyzing the, the sponsor's uh, code. Thank you. And maybe a follow-up question is like, uh, do you always rerun sponsor's code or you like, sometimes you just go with like independent, independent programming directly? So for me, I um, I usually start with the coding by myself because if I, once I see their how they did it, it's influence um, how I'm gonna um, review. So I just start with my independent um, review, um, like replicating the result first. Yeah, same, same here. And I do my uh, independent coding first to replicate the sponsor's result and then go to the sponsor's code and get surprised because their coding is always always professional than, than me and better, <laughs> better quality. And uh, I go over all the lines uh, from their coding uh, line by line. And and if, if I see anything unusual, uh, I flag them and I report to my supervisor to, for discussion. And and I think that's, so we, I, yeah, we do both like uh, one independent coding from the reviewer side and also replicating the whole code from, for the sponsor, from the sponsor. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. It, it ran in your presentation, you also mentioned that you asked the submitter to uh, specify some alternative packages to use. Yeah, yes. Can you elaborate a little bit on like, oh, why that, is, that was needed? Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question because uh, depending on the package, the, the estimates could be a little, like, not, not completely different, but a little different based on the, like, the, this, the standard deviation calculation, the variance calculation, and uh, about uh, some 
some different results incurred by rounding. So uh, we uh, tried to specify all available uh, options uh, during the meeting uh, to to like learn from their package. So uh, if they are using a specific package for analysis, this time it was just simple for because it just was just survival package for Kaplan Meyer estimates. But uh, for, we asked whether if they're uh, conducting any other like uh, analysis, uh, we asked them to specify all possible uh, package that has the same analysis methods, and we I tried them all to see uh, how different they are, and if they're not really different, and we try to accept the sponsor's uh, uh, package, but if don't. Uh, we flag it and uh, have a discussion internally first, and ask the sponsor to modify the, the package if they're, they're if they're not using the right package. So that's kind of our uh, practice during the review. Thank you for sharing. I totally agree. I feel like many times there is not a right answer, but there are different ways to implement things, and it's good to try out different methods and uh, just like to make sure we are not in a corner case over there for the estimation. Yeah. I guess then, like, as you said, basically, I think he also mentioned about like a slight rounding difference over there. So I think it's probably normal to see that the FDA independent coding result is slightly different from the sponsor, right? And the, if if the difference is not that big, and if like, basically, if the clinical conclusion doesn't change, then it shouldn't be a big issue. Right? I think so. But uh, whenever I see the discrepancy I report to the statistical reviewer. So um, I'm not, um, I don't make a decision by myself. Like we talk internally first and see um, whether this is critical or should we address these issues to the sponsor. So um, yeah, so we sometimes see, we many times, many times we see the discrepancy when we use different um, packages or between the result of like coding in R and versus coding in SAS. But um, yeah, the rounding issues could be um, very frequent issues, but as long as it's not a critical issue, we don't, um, I think it should be okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And maybe switch the topic a little bit. Uh, I think like uh, Ryan, both Ryan and he said, you, in both of your presentation, you mentioned like pretty close collaboration with the submitter. I think for in Ryan's case, there were like two or three pre-submission meetings talking about the like submission format. And uh, he saw like for the R consortium pilots, like there were definitely a lot of meetings with Pa and yourself like before the submission. Yeah, maybe just a, whether you have any general guidance to a sponsor if they want to submit our code or our, our markdown in their future submission, like what information to, to provide uh, during the pre-submission meeting, how early and uh, how to help the, the reviewer, like FDA reviewer, like uh, to, to review those like our, our base submissions. Um, I can start, maybe Ryan can add more, um, but um sponsor can start conversation early on and then like provide version of R or list of packages or explain like intent to use the open source software um, and reason behind why sponsor wants to use certain package like things like that um also the individual reviewers may be or may not be familiar with R so um, if they are not familiar with R, then um, they can request help of statistical analysts like me. So um, FDA can prepare for the application review um, ahead of time as well. So I think the um, establishing agreement between FDA and sponsor uh, would be an important um, thing. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a good answer, and of course, uh, we are uh, getting a lot of help from our uh, division of analytics uh, uh, from Jesus and Paul's office, uh, analytics and information uh, informatics staffs, 
and uh, now it became a division. <laughs> and my recommendation would be like uh, clarify the goals with using our uh, and also specify the plan as early as possible, uh, so the FD can be prepared with the best available reviewer uh, for our communication. So, uh, for myself, I worked for a couple NDAs for like six to nine months, and then I completely forgot about like uh, using R, and then I have to switch back to R to do R uh, like uh, uh, review, and then that it's not uh, like an easy transition. So. I think uh, uh, if you can uh, notify FDA that you're you, that you will use R, and they will try to find the best available uh, reviewer for the submission. And there, I believe there is no limit topics limited for discussion. So open as much as you can. Like uh, so, in our discussion, the sponsor were very specific. They they said they want to use tidyverse. They want to use like a couple certain package for management. Do you can you accept this? Or so they they try to get my agreement for like a very specific package to see whether I'm uh, knowledgeable or okay to use it, and I, yeah, and I think that was kind of great practice and very uh, honest uh, communication because um, we know what we know we and and we try to learn uh, if we don't know about uh, there's their uh, a plan so I think. Uh, those kind of uh, com like communications are very important. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Like, yeah, actually, like the practice uh, of like a uh, like a uh, reaching out to Paul and his team. So basically, that sounds like even if like the the stats reviewer for this program, if that reviewer is a primarily stats programmer, like this pro uh, this reviewer may get extra analytical support from a uh, from like basically Paul and his team on our programming, right? Yes. Oh yeah, very much so. <clears throat> cool. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, another question, I think like uh, right in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, in the very beginning, like you if you have some uh, some challenges of like installing the proprietary package submitted by the by the company. And then um, later on, you ask them to like uh, upload it to GitHub. Yeah, just kind of like want to hear yourself, like whether it will be easier for, from a FDA reviewers or FDA staff point point of view, whether it's easier to kind of work on an open source package uh, compared to com uh, proprietary uh, R package. And uh, also, also like uh, whether it's like operation, operationally easier and whether you will perceive that you will be like more trusted if the package is out there and there are other people using that. Yeah. Uh, so, well, if it's in GitHub or uh, able to install from CRAN, uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, that's more well well used and uh, frequently used soft, uh, package than the sponsors pack than the sponsors package, and it, it's easy to download. And well, when I download Survival or like or ggplot uh, use ggplot package, uh, I don't need to do any kind of uh, uh, like inspection for those packages, right? Because it's well known package. But for company on package, for proprietary package, it's a difficult thing. Uh, it's a different animal. So uh, this time uh, I was lucky because their company on package was just uh, like uh, formatting the table in a better uh, a way. And But I, I had to check all line by line from their package to see any uh, like un, uh, any unknown like sources included in the package, but it was coupled. Uh, it was pretty easy. But if the package comes in with di difficult algorithm, I know it's like some companies are developing their in-house or their own like com complex uh, uh, algorithm for analysis. But uh, I think everything has to be clear, super clear, uh, to make the reviewer understand uh, the process and the logic uh, to run before they run uh, run run it. Thank you. There's also the um, R validation hub that we can use for most general packages. Company developed packages like Ryan's talking about, in some sense, serve the role that macros serve in SAS. Um, 
So we regard that as perhaps a little different. It's when we have more complex analytic procedures that are in proprietary packages that we have increased levels of concern. Um, and occasionally, but not often, we're starting to see that, particularly with integration of machine learning methods. Thanks for sharing. I, I see like in the in the Q and A there is a question about validation. Basically, I think like for the Rain and Pi, as you mentioned, for those like commonly used packages such like Deploy R and ggplot two, seems like a, like the FDA reviewer and staff are trust them pretty well, right? And I saw that <clears throat> there are a couple of uh, packages like have like a validation document available to the public by our foundation and maybe by our validation hub. So like for those kind of like commonly used uh, packages uh, in general, like uh, you will believe they are there with pretty good quality. Right? Um, yeah, if we go back to the statistical software clarifying statement, it has to be their testing procedures for using those should be well documented. And we could, you know, one could argue that the R validation hub is one type of documentation to show that those um, are available. When we get into proprietary packages, it's up to the sponsor to document appropriately that their software does what it claims to do, that it's fit for the intended use. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for, for sharing the R validation hub. I think that will be a very, very good resource for any companies who are developing their in-house uh, or proprietary R package. I think they have pretty comprehensive guidance over there, uh, some good practice around testing, et cetera. Yeah. One thing that I can add is um, if the pro uh, package is provided by the sponsor or uh, package is new, uh, one way that I use is trying it with different program, um, different programming language. So like such as SAS. So I use SAS and R together for cross-checking and see if both provides the um, identical result. So that's one way to validate this unknown or new R packages. Yeah, that's the same practice from my, my end too. Yeah. Also uh, I sometimes I compare the results, especially for primary analysis results that I'm concerned for when using R for this time. I run all the analysis process together uh, to see whether they match the, the results. So that was kind of uh, like a new practice because R was used this time. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I feel like if within industry, sometimes we do that as well. If it's like a new methodology, then we might try to program using two different languages over there. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I see that another highly rated question from the Q&A is about like whether FDA will share a guidance uh, around maybe prerequisites uh, like for our base submission. I guess Ryan, both Ryan and Hisu shared some like uh, like learnings from, from your experience, such as like uh, dependency or how to submit a proprietary package. Yeah, I guess whether you foresee that FDA may come up with the guidance or do you foresee that, that guidance or example may come from some like cross-functional, cross-industry working groups, such as the R consortium submission working group, et cetera. Um, FDA probably would prefer the R consortium working group model. Um, developing a guidance, uh, publishing a guidance, collecting comments is quite involved and tends to be focused on really high profile issues such as how to conduct um, clinical trials during this COVID um, pandemic interruptions. So I'm not sure that our submissions rise to a level of a guidance. Um, we would probably prefer to work through a um, nonprofit organizations such as the R Consortium. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, no more comment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think like also just a kind of shout out for the working group. Basically, the Ankara Social Working Group is open to everybody. Yeah, so if you have a uh, specific ideas on how the like uh how the guidance should look like, what are the questions like we want to work on, just feel free to like uh join the working group. You can find the information in the Ankara Social website. And go, going through the questions in Q&A, I see there are also questions about using like SAS in our hybrid submission, for example, maybe mm -hmm. using one language for data generation and one language for like TL, TLF generation. I just wonder uh, whether you have any like uh, concerns on that. Is there any challenges uh, you foresee? Uh, any tips for people who want to do this hybrid submission? Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, it is better to submit in one language to make a stream streamline review, uh, like not switching back from SAS to R, R to SAS. Uh, but uh, based on like uh, specific purpose, uh, I think it will be okay. And at, when sponsor is just a hybrid of SAS and R, we accept it because we uh, thought uh, that it, that will cause no problems in our reviews. And our goal is not like reviewing the codes. Uh, I, I mean, the reviewing. Um, I mean, and the, whether the codes, whether the package are well made or not. It's it's the science uh, that included in in the in the data. So if they are making correct science with uh, their data, their their gears, their tools, whatever uh, language I think is okay. Uh, but uh, most of us are familiar with SAS and R, so that will be the two majority language that will be considered yeah but as a reviewer i think uh, like one one language is more easier to deal with but uh if but if the hybrid can make like better uh solution uh, uh why not uh, why not accepting it so i may accept it yeah oh paul please um yes we have hybrid workflows internally um it can be more challenging now, um, as Ryan alluded and Hesu alluded to, is that we're moving from a PC-based SaaS support to a server base. So going back and forth is a little more challenging right now. Um, but if we can um, use one tool consistently in one stage, and another for a different stage, that's probably preferable to intermixing the two freely. Um, what I mean by that is if one performs the analytics in SAS and data munging in SAS, one could still perform um, the visualizations, for example, in R. And we've seen even internally um, for about almost 10 years, um, those types of workflows going on. So I think that type of formulation is probably more acceptable. Where we run into issues is if we have a SAS macro that calls R um, and specific R programs or vice versa, um, there could be implementation issues on our end. Well, based on my experience, uh, like the, when the whole review was submitted through by SAS, but some I, uh, information request questions are submitted by R, those kind of uh, uh, their, the sponsored answers were, were addressed using R, like especially for graphics, uh, for, yeah, for because R uh, provides some better graphics, good colors. So I think that was one reason that sponsor uh, illustrated their uh, response with uh, R programming. Uh, and also they submitted the code, but uh, for most of the general uh, review process, uh, uh, it, they, they tried to keep like, one language, like mm -hmm. Prograph did kept one language and also the other and the RCTs kept one SAS language for the whole review. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the, the the consideration. So it sounds like if uh if a like a sponsor want to submit a hybrid, uh, it would be nice if they can use different languages for for kind of independent tasks mm -hmm. or independent chunks. Yes. The nested ones will cause some headache for yeah. the reviewers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Cool. And I see there are a couple of questions about like RE and the RE environment and using the RE, RE file, uh, like a file to kind of like manage a package version. And also a question about Docker basically container based solution. Uh, I wonder whether you want to share a little bit on like how FDA staff manage package right now. And Paul, I know you shared a little bit on the IT, like uh, like uh, like restricts uh, from FDA from in the working group meetings. Could you maybe share a little bit on your thoughts on like in the future, like how the package management may may be done in FDA? Sure. So there is a pilot called Fiddle um, that looking into providing a more enterprise level um, R system based on some of the R Studio products. Um, that's actually more of where the package management exists. Um, most of our reviewers are at a slightly different level where Things are just basically being done um, on the laptop level. So there is the possibility for evolution um, to a enterprise approach for package management at some time in the future. Docker is a problem right now. We've had an early attempts to use Docker, um, but they were not terribly successful. Um, part of it was that the officially approved version of Docker that we have at, for FDA was not consistent with what sponsors were providing as test cases. Um, more recently, Docker has um, gone to a different subscription model. So even to test, we would not be able to use a free version. So <clears throat> because of that, I think Docker is probably not a suitable platform at this stage. Um, there are ongoing discussions within the art consortium working groups, um, whether a different um, container platform such as Podman might be more appropriate. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, if anyone wants to contribute to this like future, like a container based uh, pilot, please feel free to join the R Consortium working group. Yeah, and another related question I saw is uh, asking that whether it's okay to use a snapshot of CRAN or MRAN to kind of specify the package version. I guess from the R Consortium pilot one, we did use MRAN. So maybe from Kisu and Paul, it sounds like uh, that could be a good practice for people to specify the package version, right? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, and we run into that problem in the proprietary world even that the um, different builds of SAS have different capabilities. And in some cases, we've had to say, oh, this is not working because we need TS5 M1 or something like that instead of what we were using. So that exists, um, some of those types of issues exist both in the proprietary and in the open source world. Thank you. Cool. Maybe to switch the topic a little bit, I know like when talking about our shiny is in everybody's mind. Uh, yeah, I just wonder like, uh, like from FDA side, like are you using shiny? Do you have any shiny app developed like for review purpose? And have you seen any shiny based submission uh, for, uh, for uh, like, uh, like a US fictional product? Yeah. Uh, I can start first. So I haven't seen any shiny, uh, shiny app submission through uh, official review, but uh, uh, we have some internal group, uh, developer group uh, that who, who are developing uh, in, uh, apps for internal use. And I, uh, Paul uh, may uh, add more about this group. And yeah, I think uh, as a reviewer, limited to my perspective and experience, I think shiny app uh, can be very uh, helpful if those interactive dynamic features can 
be, be demonstrated it in like a specific an analysis to address uh, like questions in IR. Uh, but I consider like static tables and graphs are still good enough for uh, like a streamlined review process so far. Yeah, but who knows like how the future will change. <laughs> right. So we are developing um, Shiny apps for internal use um, to help out with some things. Um, these tend to be more specific cases that are not addressed otherwise. Um, we have yet to see a shiny app as part of a submission, but as um, Hey Sue and Ryan were pointing out, as part of their standard workflow, is they attempt to perform the analysis independently without looking at sponsors' code, and so the shiny app needs to basically complement that workflow. That we need to be able to believe that the sponsor's formulation is correct in the first place before we'll um, look into specific results. In some ways, this is me talking as opposed to FDA. Um, I think some of the interactive and visualization type issues may be more receptive to um, clinical reviewers might be the ones who would benefit more than statistical reviewers in some cases just because we're more focused on providing that independent review activity yeah i can just echo what paul said um so i think um our, i'm using our shiny app as well for my internal research but um, um, our Shiny app with the submission would be helpful and useful as a supplement. If it is not a supplement, I think as a regulatory review perspective, like we have to verify whether it provides the accurate and reliable result. That means we have to understand behind the background process. So, um, I think it increased the review complexity if it's going to be the primary um, mm -hmm. things that we have to verify. Yeah. Right. There is one thing that could help, but we're not necessarily advocating it entirely is um, the um, Joe Chang came up with the um, R meta package or the meta package that um, allows one to um, produce code, R code that would replicate a specific um, shiny snapshot, for example. So those types of tools are something that folks may want to consider. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. Kind of like for documentation purpose, like we want to, we, we don't want to like purely rely on our interactive interface over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. but uh, just adding a comment. So for the program, uh, the R mark that output, the HTML output was kind of useful when we communicate with this, the clinicians. Uh, they like the new format uh, and it's easy to uh, scroll over all uh, the results or just moving by tabs, uh, it, it, it was making us communication more effective. So if Shiny could show up, be kind of play that role. And also clinicians are uh, curious about what happened if the levels of this uh, serum goes up and down. So if, if the answer can be provided in a dynamic way, uh, that could be another way to use Shiny as an independent uh, uh, tool uh, for re review is addressing uh, specific questions. Yeah. 
you know, one thought is that maybe it will be helpful if like the sponsors or the companies open source their tools, like instead of like a share a uh, submitting a shiny, and maybe like like a uh, open sourcing their shiny tool or analytical tools, so that FDA reviewers can use those tools if these those tools are trusted, getting trust and then use those tools to generate a implement a shiny app by yourself for your independent review. Then that can be used for kind of like clinical like share like uh, information sharing with clinicians etc. Right? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And another question, uh, I guess, Ryan, you mentioned a little bit that uh, in your in your review, like basically alternative data format was used, like basically CSV was generated and our data was generated. I think like many our users experience that like the XPT file required right now is not particularly friendly for for R, yeah. So, like, I just want to hear your thought on, like, in the future, do you foresee that, like, this might be the XPT requirement be changed, or maybe a digital data format can be used for supplemental purposes, etc. Well, uh, I, I first want to clarify that uh, when we are doing review uh, from December 2020 uh, to July 2021, the FDA rolled evidence guidance, uh, uh, draft guidance for those. Uh, registry-based or claim-based uh, 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 documents ha hasn't been published yet. They were published like in, in November, December, 2021. So during the time of re review, uh, the sponsor had a lot of freedom uh, to try a lot of things. And we had no specific guidelines at the time. So we we had a lot of discussion with different office, of Office of Computational Science, and also Real World Evidence Subcommittee uh, were the main um, uh, divisions uh, uh, office that we had discussion how to handle these data issues. And the issues uh, that I address is uh, it, it's because the real world data, it's they're, they're using the raw data, uh, not transform into status format. It has longer variable names, like the length of the, uh, it, it's, 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 it has longer uh, things in their data. <laughs> so if we tr transform that into our FT format, expert five, uh, a lot of the data was supposed to be truncated. So that's why uh, uh, they were requesting for version eight. And uh, based on the discussion, we thought version eight is only beneficial for lifting the limits of characters. Uh, however, uh, that could like uh, further increase the file size, file size, and we were concerned about uh, the audit trails. And but uh, after the discussion, uh, although FDA cannot require version 8, uh, accepting it was a different uh, issue. So we decided to ex accept version 8 by reviewing the sample data. And that's why we asked the, the sponsor to submit the data so we can play it from our end. And, and that was, uh, so that's why we accepted version 8 data and, and working with, uh, with our uh, markdown uh, with a, as a tool. And I believe uh, in the future, there will be more submissions coming uh, with rural data with that irregular data format. But I believe the new guidance uh, has some like guidelines uh, that uh, recommends to use see, that, see this format. I don't know like that that is finalized, but probably there will be more systematic approach to handle those irregular type of rural data in the future. We can also point to the study data technical conformance guide for um, most a lot of the standard issues in that area. Um, as Ryan's pointed out, we can accept more recent versions of XPT than version five. Um, the I think we might we might lost Paul. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe while waiting for Paul to join us, yeah. Another question, related question, I saw in the in the Q and A is like Ryan, you mentioned that like in the in, right now, probably the the real world data guidance uh, re, uh require people re recommend people to use CDIS format, and it, there was also pointing out that that the CDIS format may not be especially R friendly either. 
Yeah. So, so basically, like, uh, is there any thought on like how we might kind of like influence the cities, like a uh, group to to kind of like like uh, accommodate some of the the challenges when using R? Yeah. Um, it's CDISC is again a, a consortium of its itself, and most companies have uh, representatives on the CDISC boards and development groups. So, um, you guys have a say. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it's the same similar story for the ADRG. I think when we did the R consortium R submission pilot one, the ADRG format is very SaaS focused as well. And then we're hoping to work with the fields working group to maybe update some of the, the, the sessions over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, I think we lost you for, for a second. Like, uh, do you have additional thoughts on the data formatting question? Oh, um... I've been at FDA since 2008. Um, nobody was happy when I with XPT files when I came on board. There have been several pilots that didn't really pick, uh, take off, and we're still using XPT. So I don't know that um, anything has come along that has gained widespread acceptance and uh, will be allowed to replace it. But um, it doesn't mean we should stop trying. But for whatever reason, there are issues involved. Um, so hopefully things will improve with the subsequent um, version eight issues that Ryan was talking about with the length of the um, variable names. Um, the version five XPT file format is not terribly efficient when it comes to transmission or storage. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and feel free to let us know if any industry can help with any evaluations or any information. I know there are a lot of people who want to maybe like establish a working group looking into that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. Anything to add? Oh, mm -hmm. um, well, basically, I, I think that's still an ongoing issue that we've tried it a couple times. There was one one attempt to look at HTML as replacing XPT that didn't lead anywhere um, that I'm aware of. So if there is a better method that industry wants to propose, I think people are open to it, but um, There seems to be deficiencies that have been pointed out with the alternatives to XPT um, so far. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All right, I see we only have seven minutes left, so maybe I will close with the last question. Yeah, so my last question to to everyone, to Ryan, Hisu, and Paul is that like um, like how can we kind of help like uh, to make your life easier when reviewing our like uh, our our base submissions? Yeah, I guess like you shared a, a bit of tips like in your presentation, etc. Maybe the last question is just like any final tips on how we we can make your life easier when we submit uh, our base submissions. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. So, so uh, I I believe so. That this time, uh, the program submission was uh, kind of an excellent data science practice because it provided all necessary documents with good explanations. Uh, but what could be even better is like uh, annotating uh, the codes uh, uh, will be better, better, especially for the proprietary uh, package because there was actually no uh, like. Uh, detailed description in the cloud. So I have to understand line by line, uh, which takes uh, lots of time. Uh, so those good description uh, will be uh, very helpful uh, for 
for reviewers to save time and also both understand the sponsor's perspective for using uh, those packages. Yeah, oh, so I think, um, yeah, like I echo Ryan, like, because we have to evaluate the, re um, the submission independently and replicate the result by ourselves. So maybe um, easy to read and then clear, um, like what version they use, what packages they use, and then like do the good coding practice like commented it what this code are doing like so that might make us easier and then as i said um communicate with the fda review team only on so that we can plan um plan ahead and then aware of it so that might make it easier I, i'd echo my colleagues good documentation um, good programming practices. Um, a while back, Fuse put out a white paper for some of that. Um, our colleagues in CDRH have good machine learning practices document um, for those who are moving into that space. So I think that's one of the key things is that having code and processes that are well documented definitely helps from our end uh, when we're having to figure everything out and become what i used to call human compilers it becomes um much more time consuming and that's becomes a real problem when we're on a um high priority review clock. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for sharing. So with that, I guess I'll close today's session. Yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation. Also for the, the transparent discussion over here, it's very nice to learn kind of like your day-to-day -day work and uh, like it also it help us to kind of like make sure that like uh, we prepare our submission packages accordingly. Uh, and also thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, the recording will be available on the Archive Social uh, Art Adoption Seminar website uh, probably several days later. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you and hope everybody have a good day. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You thank you so much. Bye. Bye.